evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, Barton Deacon political strategist Graham Morris, who was part of the team that won the 1996 election for John Howard and the Liberal Party. Parliamentary Secretary for Housing and Homelessness, Doug Cameron. The Australian Financial Review's editor-at-large and author of Killing Fairfax, Pamela Williams. The founder of Youth Without Borders, Yasmin Abdel-Majid. And the Shadow Minister for Climate Action and Environment, Greg Hunt. Please welcome our panel. Now, as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag on your screen. Our first question tonight comes from Lance Roger. Thanks, Tony. My question is to Doug Cameron. Tony Abbott has said that he wouldn't be prepared to lead any minority government following the election. So, there's two parts of the question. Firstly, would Kevin Rudd be prepared to do so? And if he were, what previously announced Labor policies would he be prepared to compromise on? Doug Cameron. Well, thanks, Lance. Uh, I can't speak for the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has to make these decisions himself. Uh, that's uh, something I really can't tell you. My view is that uh, we want to win the election in our own right, and we are a big chance of doing that. I think there's been a huge turnaround in the feeling towards the Labour Party. I think the lies and nonsense that's coming from the Liberal Party is being exposed day in, day out. And this is going to be a very close election, but we can win. I'll bring you straight back to that question, though. Uh, you've been asked about minority government. It's on a lot of people's minds. Tony Abbott said he won't do it. And the question is, mm. you say you won't speak for Kevin Rudd. Should he enter a minority government if it was a close election? That's up to the Prime Minister. I can't... I, you, Tony, have, I, you have I, opinions, I, though. I, I, I have used opinions. to have opinions. I used to have opinions. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think uh, my, my view is that... Uh, that Keeping Tony Abbott and the extremists in the coalition from government is extremely important. And that's going to be a big call for the Prime Minister to make. And if uh, there is a, a hung parliament, then someone has to fo form government, and I hope it's the Labour Party. Greg Hunt. Uh, look, uh, Lance, our view is that this has been a, a terrible failure. When people come to write the history of Australia in the 21st century, Something tells me that uh, nobody's going to say this has been a great government. Probably not even a good government and probably at the lower end of the spectrum for the, for the century. Things can be profoundly better, but it, there has to be a clear choice. And I say profoundly better. At the moment, we have a budget crisis. We've got a terrible humanitarian catastrophe on the borders and we've got a crisis of trust in government. So the way to do that, we say, is to give Australians a really clear choice. And that's why we've taken a very clear position that we want to win the trust of the Australian people and govern in our own right so as we never repeat the sort of uh, economic catastrophe, the human tragedies on the borders, and then the loss of trust and instability that we've seen in the last three years. Yasmin. I just... It's interesting when, when um, Tony Abbott said that, the first thing I thought was, Oh, cool. I hope there is a hung parliament. Maybe then we'll see Turnbull versus Rudd as, you know, a fair few of us hope. So, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't... I can't speak for anyone in the parties, but I think it would be an interesting thing if we did get a hung parliament because it is going to be really close. And if it's really close, it means that people clearly can't make a decision because maybe it's two evils that they can't decide between. So you don't take the view that uh, Greg Hunt just expressed that uh, hung parliament that lasted three years was a kind of catastrophe? Oh, look, it, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the greatest three years, but I don't think it was a catastrophe. I think there was all sorts of things that played into it. And to call it a catastrophe would be, I guess, disingenuous. Political speak. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Political speech. <laughs> it would, That's it would. It, would it wouldn't be straight yeah. up. Pam Williams, what do you think? Well, I wouldn't call it a catastrophe, of course, but uh, and because a great deal of, of legislation was passed by the government. But, you know, I think from the point of view of the public, there has been a sense that the government had never quite you know, been able to fulfil its mandate. It had gone on m making deals and horse trading all the way through and notwithstanding there's been a lot of legislation passed. I think in the end that was an incredibly damaging uh, situation for Gillard, that notwithstanding that she had proved herself to be a great deal maker, she, uh, she could not create a government that gave the impression of stability. And I actually think that the general public would, uh, you know, not 
be welcoming a repeat of that. And I suspect that with uh, the change in um, the sentiments between Labor and the Greens, we won't see that in any case. Graham Morris. Scares the hell out of me. <laughs> um, look, another three years of what we've just had is just not what the country needs. And I don't think it's what the community wants. Look, I, I, I used to run the marginal seats for the Liberal Party around the country and I got a rough idea of, of each of the marginal seats. And when I add them all up and have a look at the polls and get a bit of a feel for what's going to happen, it seems to me if Kevin Rudd has a good campaign and Tony Abbott has a shocker, the best the Prime Minister can do is roughly a hung parliament. It's very hard to see he wins enough seats to govern in his own right. You would say and that, wouldn't you? No, 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 it's fair deal. <laughs> you would yeah. say that. And, and you know, well, he's starting behind, Come thanks on. to your lot. Come on, you would say but, that. But, but it is one of the things that I, I, I really, really hope that we don't get. It hasn't worked anywhere in Australia. State government, minority governments, and this one, it's just a bloody mess. When you say it hasn't worked, I'm just going to bring you up on that. I mean, it did, they did pass a lot of legislation. The government Good remained intact for three years. It didn't fall like many mm. hung parliaments or minority governments do. No, so uh, where, where was the big disaster, as you see it? Because if there's a change of government, or even, even now, you know, Kevin Rudd has sort of tried to undo two-thirds of what Julia Gillard put up, and I, th I suspect if Tony Abbott wins, then a lot of that la Labor legacy will not last. It just, it just was a period that is not going to be lasting, except for the disability insurance scheme, and that was a beauty. OK, first day of the election campaign. We've got a lot of questions. The next one is from Michelle Slater. Oh, good day. Yes. Now, today's Daily Telegraph, it ran a front page that said, finally, you've got the chance to kick this mob out regarding Kevin Rudd. And look, I have a copy of it here for those people <laughs> interstate. Um, now, do you think that this is a blatant breach of basic journalistic, journalistic ethics and balance, or do you think that this is just fair editorial comment? Pam Williams, let's start with you. Well, I don't think I'd call it um, a blatant breach of anything. I think it's an unusual front page. I think it, uh, it um, certainly goes to uh, the, the notion of uh, that newspaper deciding it's going to really have a very big punch straight out of the blocks. And I think you know, it's a very big attention-seeking uh, front page. I would just like to make the point that my own newspaper, The Financial Review, has made a small entrance into the stakes of making an early call, which was to, we ran on the front page of today's paper. Um, um, an editorial that came off the front that also that said uh, the, gov the uh, Gillard and Rudd governments had proved themselves structurally unfit to govern. So we've made a very small yeah. stab at uh, the front page editorial at the beginning. It is absolutely true, you're right, that uh, these sort of things are, are not generally run at the beginning of a campaign, but at the end when everyone sums up. So I think you'd have to... I wouldn't call it a, uh, an ethical breach at all. Um, Can I ask you this? Do you think, but, it, was a, do you think you it was a Cole Allen uh, headline? Because we know that uh, Rupert Murdoch's chief head kicker has been flown out here he from has. New York to take control of the tabloids during he the has. election campaign, well, particularly the tabloids. Yeah, I'm not sure that he's um, going to take total control of them. I think some of those tabloids are run by very, very robust um, editors themselves, and I wouldn't like to sort of make the call as to who it was that drew up that front page, but it was certainly arresting, um, and perhaps uh, you know um, flattery is the best form, you know, because it was in in the vein of the great headlines we have seen from Cole Allen over many many years. Um, in the uh, I remember in the US at the time of the Iraq War vote, um, uh, Cole Allen put on the front page of the New York Post a headline that said. Axis of weasel, and on the and he put weasel heads on the tops of I think France and somebody else, you know, who who votes. So you know these are in a very long tradition of very uh, tough Murdoch headlines, and uh, you know, but I think they're certainly out to make their point, and I think you probably going to find they're going to keep making that point all the way through. Doug Cameron, can you actually win a tight election if the Murdoch tabloids are against you, as they clearly are? Well, of course we can. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the tabloids at News Limited are looking like a fully paid-up branch of the Liberal Party at the moment. You know, it's pretty... You know, that's entirely up to them what they run on their front page. But if you've ever seen bias, that bias is there. I've not got a lot of time for News Limited. They don't have a lot of time for me. Uh, really? But that's, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a democracy. And if you dish it out, you've got to take it. But uh, I have to tell you, uh, I think that's uh, bias. And everyone knows 
that anything you read in the news limited publications between now and the election is based on bias. Anything you read in news limited publications is based on making sure that Tony Abbott becomes the Prime Minister of this country and that is not a good thing for democracy. Do you see Rupert Murdoch's hand operating behind this? Because Tony Abbott said today that some in the Labour Party see conspiracies like this where they don't exist. Well, you've only got to look at the tweets that uh, Rupert Murdoch's been making recently and it's all about getting rid of a Labour government. Uh, Rupert Murdoch's made his mind up and he's now telling the people of Sydney how they should vote. I don't think the people of uh, Sydney will look at an expat Australian who's become an American citizen, who is a, a multi-billionaire, who is not here having to deal with the real issues for working people. How do you get jobs? How do you make sure we get decent infrastructure? How do we deal with health and education? These are the big issues. What would Rupert Murdoch know about that? And his papers are out there telling people how they should vote. And I think it's, you know, it's him actually misusing uh, his power and influence, but he's got a right to do that. But people should understand there should be a bit of critical analysis about what's going on in News Limited newspapers, and it's not good for democracy. Graham Morris. Most of that was just drivel. Well, wait till you hear this. <laughs> 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 Look, if, 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 if Rupert was driving all, if, if, if Rupert was driving all the papers around the country, then this <laughs> afternoon <clears throat> four of his editors would have been sacked because four of them, the Courier Mail, the Advertiser in, in, in South Australia, the, uh, the, the Herald Sun in Melbourne, they didn't do it. It was the Telegraph. Nobody's argued as a conspiracy. Hang on. The Telegraph, the Telegraph was the yeah. only way that, that one that did it. And I, I, mm. I actually believe well, that true. the Telegraph, out of all the newspapers in this country, um, understands its audience and the people who buy its newspapers better Funny. than anyone. <laughs> and, yes. and, 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 <laughs> yeah. and I suspect yeah. that they have sensed that their own audience and their own readership have had enough but yeah, it was. Graham, it can was I just, uh, just a quick interruption there. Uh, what, do you, what do you think Cole Allen is out here to do? Yeah, I've heard all these conspiracies that somehow he's out here to run election campaigns and whatnot. I suspect <laughs> Rupert. No, I suspect Rupert has actually said, "Look, my longtime enemy, the Fairfax organisation, is in trouble, and I want to make sure that the Telegraph and the others are strong in this period where it looks as if the Age." and the Sydney Morning Herald and the Financial Review, his long-term opponents may be in trouble and, and they may merge, they may close, they may Excuse not come me, out on I Monday to Friday. So. Who knows? <laughs> 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 Who knows? I doubt that, but, Graham. But Cole, 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 Allen, is, Cole <laughs> Allen is the man I would send <laughs> out to have yeah. a fight like that. OK, yeah. I'll come back to you on that, Pam, but uh, Greg Hunt wanted to jump well, in and I'll look, hear from Yasmin uh, as well. Just to, yeah. to speak to Michelle, I actually don't think you've brought in the strongest headline of the week. The strongest headline of the week was probably the Sydney Morning Herald. And the Sydney Morning Herald uh, front page splash banner last week was Labor's shame after ICAC. And they had spent years campaigning on that issue. And it was a massive headline. It defined everything. And I said, you know, I haven't imagined... Well, I'm of the view that the guys at the Daily Telegraph are probably a little jealous that they didn't go in as hard as that because Greg, it was a pretty Greg, strong uh, way of putting it. Greg, we'll, we'll come to that issue because uh, I know we've got a question on it coming up. But, but uh, the, the point what's is a, what's that a, there what's are a variety what, but, but of But actually, no, let, let me just uh, ask you a quick question. Yeah. To follow up on that headline, what's, what's a front page like that worth to the Abbott campaign? Day one, get rid of this mob. You had a variety of views and you have a variety of views around the country. And we have a multiplicity of channels now, whether it's the internet, whether it's digital radio, all sorts of things. Q&A, that's one voice. I'm not sure how many you reach. I think the EP said pretty close to a million. So you get a chance to speak to a lot of people, fortunately, straight down the centre. Well, actually, um, you're the one who's talking to the people, by the way. We all do. <laughs> yeah. We all do. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the point here is very clear, and that is there are lots of channels, there are lots of different views, but what is interesting is that both uh, one paper today, um, plus the Fin Review, plus the Sydney Morning Herald, have all found that there is a structural weakness with modern Labor. That's what's really been found. Yasmin. 
But it's interesting you said, you know, there are other papers that didn't do it. Well, there's got to be some plausible deniability <laughs> built into it, I mm. think. But, <laughs> and the, the other, I suppose, interesting aspect is the commercial arm of things as well. And, and I think over the last couple of years, uh, the papers, the Murdoch press have been more and more, I guess, overt. But, and I read something about this idea that, you know, the NBN is something that um, the Murdoch press or Rupert Murdoch himself wasn't happy with in terms of the fact that it would compete against Foxtel. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think there's maybe something in that. And coming out that strongly from the beginning might be, it might be worth thinking about. Yeah, yeah I'll just go, uh, uh, Pam, you do get a right of reply since uh, Graham suggested that uh, Fairfax is, uh, you know, basically on its uppers. Um, it, the truth is that actually most newspapers are struggling to uh, make a, a profitable business these days. I actually am wondering whether this could be the last election campaign where newspapers have such a significant influence. Well, you may wonder that, Tony, and I think um, that whether the papers are in print, and I think probably over time we're going to see that change. I think over time they won't be in print, but for now and for the foreseeable future they are, and I just can't see um, that they're going to stop being in print. I, it's, you know, I see no sign of it at Fairfax. I see a lot of discussion and debate about it. Um, I'll throw this in. I re was reading just uh, th this week two really fascinating points. One is that Newsweek, which is such an old magazine, has now been sold uh, to a, an all-digital company. So Newsweek, the print uh, magazine, is going to become part of a digital operation entirely of another company. And, and I also note that President Obama, about four days ago, put out a, st a, a statement statement on Kindle, um, which said that the old days are gone and that newspapers aren't coming back and that the traditions are, are passing by. So for me, that's a very alarming thing to, uh, to hear. But I think, you know, I can't make a bet on how long. I can't make a bet on how long, but I certainly don't see any sign that we're all closing down shop at this point. And I think all Good. newspapers are really, really challenged. And that goes for the Murdochs as well as Fairfax. OK, I'm just going to uh, move on. Our next question uh, goes to this as well. You're watching the first election Q&A of 2013. If you'd like to compare your views on key issues with the policies of the major parties, check out Vote Compass. Uh, go to abc.net.au slash vote compass or uh, look for the link on the Q&A homepage. Our next question is from Lisa O'Connor. Um, my question is for Graham Morris. Graham, um, I have a 17-year-old daughter who um, uh, is uh, well-educated, um, a debater, um, has strong views on, like a lot of people of, of her age and her generation, she won't vote in this election, but she'll vote in future elections. Strong views on gay marriage, asylum seekers, social justice. Um, she's been disgusted in recent times by opinions and policies by both sides of politics. But she's increasingly swayed by Kevin Rudd and his ability to actually make contact with her in her world, that's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, because he can counteract things like today's Telegraph so instantly and seemingly tailoring it to her. And I wondered whether the coalition is as effective and whether they're fighting on the right battlefield to get into the minds of the young people. Graham Morris. Yeah, look, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I, I suspect it's not this election that will be decided by social media, but, but maybe the next one or the one after that, but not this one. You know, I, I understand what that, that your daughter is there, and she's pretty special, I've got to tell you. If she's still undecided and she gets up in the morning and has her cornflakes and tunes in to what Kevin Rudd is tweeting today, um, I can tell you, most undecided people do not. They don't. Um, they don't care about politics. They're not interested in politics. They're doing other things. They're more interested in whether or not their kids, you know, converses or their sand shoes or something can last for another month. That's, that's their focus. Um, I, I, you know, I'd like to educate your daughter. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's the attitude but, always. But, but, but yeah, look, I understand that, and we, and we, and we've got a whole generation that that is starting to communicate that way. But has Kevin but, Rudd? Uh, the, the question that was raised there is really: Has Kevin Rudd got a jump on the coalition in that he's actually hooked into this world and this way of communicating, yeah, uh, look, whereas the coalition isn't? Th th there's a bit of that, but. But look, he, he announces the election. He says, "Give me, give me five dollars." Now, trust, make it trust me, and, or make it ten. Yeah, <laughs> in, in an hour there was huge inflation. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Big inflation is under you. To me, I cry, I'm crying. It's all very well to laugh at your own joke. <laughs> But uh, actually, he said ten, <laughs> and you halved it. Yes. <laughs> anyway, leave, leave yeah. this, don't worry about that. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 you know, on, honestly, people deal people, people who it. decide pe we, we are not yet running the campaign for for the, the the people in the Twitter sphere or the Facebook people, but we will. Mm. But the people who are still deciding this election, honestly, do not do not go onto Facebook and see what's trending. Can I Twitter. just say in her defence, she has not made a decision. I'm simply saying that she is heavily swayed and she is saying, this is his comment, this is his response, he's come back, this is what he's saying. So she's considering both points of view. We've paid enough to have a brain expanded enough that she's doing that, which is great. But she's still questioning what is coming out of the coalition? What is Tony Abbott saying? What's he saying that's relevant to me? And she says that to me, and she's a 17 year old. Okay. And she's with a lot of kids that say the same thing. Hey, I'm going to take give me that a name to later. I'll give her some websites. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, throw that to Yasmin. You know, see, the, that attitude, I think, is why I feel, personally, as a young person who's on the Twitter sphere, um, I feel that the coalition is so disconnected because regardless of whether somebody is, um, is decided or undecided, the fact is that there is a huge um, portion of the population that's engaged on Twitter and on Facebook. And for a lot of young people, that is how you reach them and that is how you communicate with them. And the fact that Kevin Rudd has gone out and done this is, I mean, he is reaching out to us. And, and he's being able to communicate his policies and his standpoints. And that is so powerful because no young person is going to be like, hmm, I'm going to go surf and, you know, I mean, some do, I suppose, but nobody's going to go research the policies um, just in their spare time. Most people are going to wait for things to come to them. And in, if you're on Twitter, you're, I guess, following a whole bunch of people. And if... Um, and, and you'll get things that I suppose are directly related to you. And if you're on Facebook, the same thing. So I think the coalition is in fact missing out. A, there's half a million young people that are to that are to enrol in the next week. But Yasmin, isn't that um, really? Doesn't that actually go to Graham's point? Really, there are half a million young people, according to the Electoral Commission, not enrolled right now, a week mm. out from the election. I mean, a week out from the deadline mm -hmm. uh, for enrolling for the election. And. Uh, it does suggest there are a lot of people not engaged enough to have done that. Well, I will agree and say, yes, there are a lot of people, young people that are disengaged, mostly because they're disgusted by the endless electioneering. But also, there's no discussion about enrolling in, in, in the electoral roll before, before an election, really. It's only once an election is called, everyone's like, oh, my God, I need to enrol. So, I mean, that's, that's an education aspect as well. But I think the fact is your 17-year-old daughter is like myself and like a whole number of people I know. And the fact that um, Kevin Rudd in particular is really good and I think genuine or seemingly genuine. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> she has to agree with that. I don't want to misrepresent her views. She'll oh, kill either way, I get I, home. But yes. <laughs> she's asking questions, that's all. OK, I'm, I'm going to throw to, um, to Greg Hatton. Greg, I mean, it must be a bit disturbing for you because these people we're talking about, they're all potential recruits to the Green Army. Uh, look, uh, <laughs> we're, we're happy to have them all. We're yeah. happy to have them all. Look, uh, do they wear yeah. uniforms, by the way? Uh, <laughs> nicely tailored shirts. Uh, uh, what, what do young people want tonight? from my discussions? Because we're out in the electorate every day and on the weekend at the football club or down at the surf club. You talk with people all the time. And, uh, yes, they are interested in, in Twitter and they are engaged in social media. But at the end of the day, this is such a smart generation and they know they want substance and things that will last and they care about the long term. And the two things they talk about are jobs and debt. A lot of young people say, we're going to have to pay this back, aren't we? We're the ones that are going to have to pay back this debt. And there is a real sense of concern about that. Um, I would never want to sell short young people because they are switched on. Yes, they're engaged in social media, but at the end of the day, they are deeply switched on about these long-term issues, about getting a job on the weekend. Folks talk to me about 800,000 unemployed and the numbers that are looming. They talked about debt. We had people saying, hey, that's eight deficits in a row now, isn't it, under this mob? That's something we're going to have to pay back. So, yep, he's good at Twitter. 
and he's great at selfies. Good luck to him. <laughs> uh, but... Selfies are really important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I hope he doesn't cut himself shaving again. Uh, but honestly... <laughs> He is the fake tan of Australian politics. It washes off <laughs> overnight, and we're seeing it now. The reason the election was called on the weekend, he wanted to go to the G20, he wanted to go to the UN and be president of the world. The numbers were collapsing, and they said, quick, let's go as fast as we can. And part of it is young people are onto him because they know they okay. want jobs in the future well, and they don't want to have debt right, to pay no, All right, Doug Cameron, you should respond to that, but I want to get yeah, to my look, next question. Look, this is typical of what the Coalition have been doing for the last three years. It's just rhetoric. It's just nonsense. It's just hyperbole. And a lot of it is lies in terms of debt and deficit in this country. And you've heard the adjectives that have been used uh, here uh, today. It's just not true to say there's a crisis in this country. It's absolutely not true. Why have we got a AAA rating for free, from free agencies? Why have we got one of the lowest debts in the world? Why have we got the lo one of the lowest budget deficits in the world? Why, why have we invested in all the things that will make a, a good society for the future? The Labour Party's done that, and we have had this negativity, this nonsense, this lies coming from the coalition. And if you want to talk about substance, well, you won't get it here. You won't get it in real solutions. Go and have a look at it. No wonder Malcolm Turnbull, the last time he was on here, turned his nose up. If you look at his picture on it, the nose is well and truly turned up because I, 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 he's there. I, I do have to and if you look at Joe Hawkey, Joe Hawkey looks as if he's in a coma. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but but let's, get, let's get some substance. OK, I'm going to plug it. Sorry, but, let, but let's get some substance. Right. OK, you talk about substance. That's the issue. Now, I'm the Parliamentary Secretary for Housing and Homelessness. Now, the Coalition have got housing, housing in here. They've got no policy on homelessness. They've got two, two, pa two not paragraphs, two sentences on housing. They say, basically, it's a state government responsibility and we will reduce red tape. And that's what's going to solve housing okay, and homelessness. I'm, I'm gonna, a huge issue uh, Doug, in this country. Doug, I'm going I'm to pause issue. you. I'm going to put you on pause there because uh, there is a question specifically about that. I'm going to go to uh, Charlotte and I Regan. I don't tweet. Charlotte Regan, back to the uh, issues we were Not talking allowed. about before. Go ahead, Charlotte. <laughs> Just a few days ago, we learnt Kevin Rudd had hired three overseas election campaigners, uh, one of whom was dubbed Obama's digital attack dog. Another, mm. Matthew McGregor, was reported at being good at getting spoof videos online within minutes of a mistake being made by his opponents. How does importing a US-style negative advertising uh, square with Rudd's stated intention of no more negativity? OK, uh, I'll come to you, Doug. Uh, let's hear from Pam Williams. Well, I think that's a very, very um, interesting point to make because, in actual fact, um, if we're talking about uh, Rudd bringing in people who can do this, there are plenty of people in Australia who can do this. You know, political campaigns in Australia have been full for years and years with people who can take a mistake from the other side and they can turn that into an ad spot in maybe, you know, an hour. They can get that out very, very quickly. You don't actually need... While it might be great to bring in campaign experts from other countries and both parties do that. They both do that and they both say the other one doesn't but actually they're both just as bad guys. Um, but really, you know, both, both campaigns for a very long time have been able to bring, you know, mistakes from the other side and turn them into a really filthy ad spot as fast as you can possibly believe. You know, I never forget Keating going, uh, you know, they would bring, you know, some minor mistake and before you could could blink in the 96 campaign, you know, Graham's lot would have turned it into, you know, some massive imbroglio and it might have been a group of schoolgirls kissing Keating and, you know, mobbing him and the other side would have even turned that into a negative, yep. really, before dinner time. So it's mm -hmm. not... A, we, there are plenty of experts at doing this here without bringing in overseas experts. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Now, Cameron, uh, we could explain it. Perhaps they're on four, five, seven visas, uh, <laughs> this <laughs> Obama <laughs> That's a good point. Well... <laughs> I have never argued about bringing people in on four, five, seven visas as long as Australians get a fair go and get a chance of getting a job. And mm. that's not the position of the coalition. They want to use four, five, seven visas. Well, we need, we need, we need to go out and test whether those attack dog Australians were on well, those jobs. Well, well, well <laughs> let, just, let, let me say this. Uh, I mean, the coalition have got, you know, the, the, the big American, you know, Rupert Murdoch. 
They've got Rupert Murdoch. That's the attack dog they've got. You're not a and you saw that tonight, today. Are you, Doug? you know, the evil empire of News Limited are out yeah. there with it all hanging out today. So, you know, I think bringing a couple of people over that have got some expertise in campaigning is not a bad thing to do. Yeah, Graham Morris, um, this American team, were they really necessary? <laughs> well, it means you've got no faith in the Australian team. Um, <laughs> but, but the drivel meter's going up. Uh, well, <laughs> I tell you. Well, you're good. If, if you had faith in your Australian you're team, good. why would you bring in a couple yeah. of Yanks? Yeah. Now, Graham, I do think both sides do it. I do think yeah. both sides do it and have yeah. always done it. Um, but look, look I, I, I actually lectured in a university in, in the US on political communication. Wow. And there's not actually much that we can use, <laughs> we can pinch from the Yanks. Yeah. They are, you know, we, we are different. They're. They're, they're just trying to get their own people out to vote. And, mm. and the lady who asked before uh, uh, about you know, the Prime Minister tweeting everyone and saying, give me $10, you know, it seems to me that, that those who respond are already committed. If you are giving 10 bucks to the Labor Party, you're not going to vote for the Coalition. If that, and, but everyone is trying to focus on those people who are undecided. But you're right about the negativity, the, the questioner. And I suspect that uh, our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, is going to be positively negative. I'm going to go to our next question because, once again, mm. it uh, raises similar topics from David Bright. Oh, thanks, Tony. So this question is also about negativity. Uh, until now, Tony Abbott has been able to capitalise on the uh, internal fighting and policy mistakes that have been made by the Labor Party. Uh, but it seems that that kind of approach will no longer be effective, simply relying on criticism and negativity. So my question to the panel is this. Will Tony Abbott struggle to articulate a positive policy-focused message rather than relying simply on negativity and criticism? Greg Hunt. And no. And the reason why <laughs> is because we have uh, very clear national plans. We've got five national plans for a cleaner economy for a cleaner environment, for a stronger community, for national infrastructure and for stronger borders and national security. What's it mean in practice, though? It means that we set out these plans. So right from the outset, we are out there to achieve a million jobs. We are out there to reduce the debt and the deficit. Doug, you know, held up the document and, and had fun. The real document, <laughs> I'll, I'll raise your document, the real document yeah. that came out in the last week yeah. was the uh, national accounts. And what the national accounts showed was that we have had not just one or two, but eight consecutive deficits under Labor. 27 billion, 54 billion, 47 billion, 43 billion, and it goes on and on, this sea of red. So there are two points that Tony makes. Firstly, that we've got real plans to actually reduce the debt, reduce the deficit. But secondly, the situation we inherit is like no other in Australian history. We have had clearly a massive economic loss from this government because of those uh, deficits after deficits after deficits. And then secondly, we've had a catastrophe, just the most terrible oh, human catastrophe on our borders. 1,100 souls lost, yeah. 1,100 souls since the laws have been changed. So our view is this. Things can be better, things must be better, and we can make them better. I'll just go back to uh, the question. That, did, that, did, that, did that answer the point that you were making? Well, I think it illustrates the point that I'm making because um, what we heard was debt deficit catastrophe yeah. uh, rather Negativity. than a focus on a vision or a plan for the future. And I no, think that's the, what Australians the, want to hear. The vision is the open economy. <laughs> The vision is the society where people can aspire to be their best, where people don't have to focus on the debt which they will inherit. That does matter if they inherit that. That is a profoundly important thing. But we can be better and we can have this society where people can achieve and be their best selves. Yasmin. I think it's this obsession with debt is something that I find really interesting. I mean, firstly, the NAB chief came out today and, and said that, you know, we've got a AAA rating. This obsession with being in surplus isn't something that... Oh, sorry. Yeah, the obsession with being in surplus isn't necessarily something that's healthy. As a nation, we, mm. can, we can be in deficit. But I think the other thing, and I, and I would agree with the questioner, 
is that I don't feel that all you've said is that we have a plan and that plan is to set out how we're going to make it happen. And it sounds like an episode of The Hollow Men. You know, no, it, it, I'm honest. <laughs> I mean, you, you talk about wanting to cut tax, which is cutting revenue, but, but also wanting to increase um, the surplus or, or to create a surplus. And I, and I think, well, how are you going to make this happen? The numbers don't seem to add up. And I, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything that's convinced me, and I'm, I'm in the undecided bucket, but I haven't seen any, anything to convince me that there's actually some Sorry. substance behind this. Are you sure this. you're undecided? I, 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 <laughs> yeah, okay. go ahead. Well, look, look, I think, you know, we have to deal with facts. And I've, I've just had a look, a look at it, and the European deficit uh, for, con for governments over there to GDP is 2.9%. Uh, in Australia, it's 1.9%. Net debt in Europe that's, is an average of 74.5% of GDP. Australia is 11.7%. You're seriously debt, comparing debt us per to capita, Greece? Just wait a minute. Debt <laughs> and per Spain? capita, just wait a minute. And Italy? Debt per capita is $7,000 ahead in Australia. In Germany, it's $23,000. In the UK, it's $32,000. In France, it's $34,000. We've got a triple A rating. We've got one of the lowest debts in the world. We've got one of the lowest budget deficits in the world. We've got a country that's a great country. We should stop trash talking it the way these people are doing. And we should actually welcome the fact that the government has done a good job in the economy and it's only the trash talk that's talking it down. OK, so we've got a hand up right there. We'll go to that questioner. Go ahead. I'd just like to make the comment that um, all debt issues start small. And, you know, very important bodies yeah. like the Grant Institute have pointed out that Australia is going to have a big debt I problem if we don't fix it now. And as a young person, I don't want to inherit a big debt problem when I grow up to work, up, work off. But, but I, I hope also, when, when, you know, as a young person, when you get older, that you've got a society with, with a decent capacity to look after you. And if we go into an austerity program here, an austerity program that has proved false around the world, and that's what the coalition are saying, back to a budget surplus as quickly as possible, $70 billion they've got to find, that's going to come out of health, that'll come out of education, that'll come out of mental health, that'll come out of infrastructure, that will be the big disaster in this country. Okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm I'm pause you for a minute because I'll go back to uh, it's Joshua Crawford, isn't it? And uh, you actually have a question, Joshua, as well. So why don't you ask your question now? Well, I just wanted to ask why, despite the fact we're raising taxes across the board, from the cigarette tax to the mining tax to the carbon tax, um, we're still seeing reports from the Treasury saying we're going to have the debt increasing and increasing over the you know, years to come. Um, Kevin says that he wants to be trusted like we trusted John Howard, but at this rate, I just don't see how we can. Um, how is it possible for, him, for us to trust him to lead us back into surplus? Doug Cameron, I mean, it's, well, it, it, well, it, it, this yeah. was, last week was a pretty bad yeah. week uh, for, for your mm. government because mm. suddenly you find the, your, your budget figures have yeah. shifted yet again. So yeah. every month, every few weeks, it changes mm. again, and people are asking, why is this happening? Well. It's happening because there's great instability uh, in the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, we cannot, as a small, uh, medium-sized economy, just isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. I'll tell you why you can trust the Labour government. I'll tell you why you can trust uh, the Prime Minister. Yeah, Prime Minister. Notes, yeah. yeah, you can, you can write <laughs> notes. Because, because you, you haven't heard one word about the global financial crisis here tonight from the, from the coalition and the coalition supporters. Not one word. In fact, it was said we never had a crisis. It was a North American crisis. But we went through the biggest crisis ever. We had business just you know, stopping the in, in the economy, nothing happening, and the government had to step in. And that's why you're in some of the debt that we're in. And it was because we saved 210,000 jobs. We saved communities, we saved industries. And that was the Labour government that did that. And it's about time people realised and, and, and the, oh, the coalition side of politics, that they would have had to do something similar if they were in government. They would have had to do something similar, and they did, they, what they said they would do was wait and see. Well, you know what happens when you wait and see when you're facing a recession? You end up in a depression. So that's, what, that's why you should, look, you should look to the Labour government. You should trust us, because we've got the runs on the board. Pam Williams. 
Well, I, I, I certainly agree that, you know, Doug's finding himself in a difficult position explaining some of this. But the point of the matter is so. that by the... Yes, you are, because the, at the end of last year... Well, you're not having trouble explaining yeah. it, but, you know, it's a difficult issue because by the end of last year we had been promised... And I think this is the almost the headline mm. for the community, that we had been promised... The community had been promised the surplus over and over and over. Got promised and promised and promised and promised. And then all of a sudden, just before Christmas, it was slipped in that maybe it wouldn't be a surplus and uh, then we've got a deficit and all of a sudden in the course of a week you know the scale of the deficit the top you know the headline numbers sort of almost look as though they've gone up well not that not double but they've gone up another you know but you turned the wrong guy because that was so, never you know, a great supporter of having a budget surplus I'm sure. when it was needed when, yeah. when, and when I think and I needed. think you've had just I think you've said that you given up on having so one now as well uh, no, I, no. Look, the, uh, I think the position is that what the government's trying to do is to make sure there's enough uh, money in the economy to keep the economy moving. There are some challenges for the economy. There's no doubt about that. The government wants to get back to a surplus. We are. We, our advisors are the same advisors that the coalition had when they when they were in power. And, uh, you know, when you look at even the private sector economists, they are not getting it right. They argue about what, what, what the situation is going to be around the world. There is huge volatility out there. And I just think the public servants and the Treasury do a, the best job they can. They are experts in what they do, but it's not an exact science and governments have to live with that. I was going to hear from Yasmin. Uh, listening to this debate, um, uh, are you satisfied that the government has got it right or are you persuaded by the coalition's arguments? I suppose I, I can understand where the question is coming from because, you know, even though I personally don't necessarily see the need for an obsession with the surplus, I don't necessarily want to inherit millions and billions of dollars in, um, in deficit. But at the same time, I, understand, I look at the rest of the world where austerity measures really haven't created the stability that, that governments have promised. And, I mean, I know that the Labour Party says, you know, trust us. But unfortunately, I guess the last three years haven't given me that much cause to trust either. But on the other hand, I look at the, the LNP and they say, well, you know, the Howard years, we had all of these uh, surpluses in a row. Well, in the Howard years, we also had a lot of, you know, it, we had boom, we had, That's you know, right. the resources. And, right. and so I'm, I'm a little, I don't, I still am not convinced either way. Um, maybe I need to be an economist to understand it, but I'm still, I'm still not feeling it. Greg Hunt. You would almost... Never guess from what Doug says that over the last four years, including this financial year, Australia's revenue has grown by $85 billion. In that time, however, we've seen deficits every year. This is actually the heart of the election. This is sheep station stuff. We are playing for the future of the national economy. And the answer, Doug, I'm sorry to say, to debt isn't more debt. The examples of Spain and of Greece and of Italy. I love them as you countries. You can't compare us with Spain. The examples of Spain and of Greece and of Italy. You can't compare you've had us plenty with of go Spain. Say this: that oh. the answer to debt is not more debt because it always has to be paid back. The interest bill alone, the interest bill alone, on Labor's debt because there was none when they came to power, is enough to pay for the NDIS and two major infrastructure projects a year, forever. Okay. That alone, right. and that's why deficits okay. matter, and that's why $400 billion worth of debt is something we should be worried about. Right. Oh, Actually, we've got a few people with their hands up there. So there's a young gentleman with his hand up there. We'll go to him. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask the comparison to Greece and Italy, whom have put in austerity measures, which has made it worse, as opposed to what we've seen in Australia. They've put money into the economy, and it seems to have improved it. So Australia started uh, the global financial crisis Two laps in front of everybody else. We're now half a lap in front. But so we have, gone, we have gone back relative to the field. In the 10 weeks since the budget numbers were put down you and they collapsed, saying in the we 10 weeks since the budget numbers have gone down and collapsed, Come on. what we see is the Dow Jones has gone up, not down. It's gone up some hundreds of points. There's been no major global issue in the last 10 weeks. What's happened is that with an election looming, <laughs> the government's numbers have been shown to have been dodgy. OK, but can I just gonna, I'm just going to... Uh, there, there, there's, quite a few, uh, there's quite a few people so, want to get in on this. I just want to ask you a quick question uh, sure. based on what you just said. Uh, if 
we are in the sort of dire circumstances yeah. that you're saying, that is, of a level of debt of Greece and Spain. No, we I'm should, not saying we that. Should be, well, I know you're I'm not. I'm saying but, but you're, compared us but to them but, and said it's OK because we're not But you're them. making those comparisons as well. So here's a question. Do you say we need austerity measures in this country? No, I say that we need to live within our means. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. Let, let me give you a very simple, simple example. This year, our debt will be $30 billion. This year, uh, what we see is that government expenditure has grown by $30 billion. The entire volume, the entire volume of our deficit for this financial year is explained by government increases well, in tell expenditure. Tell us your figures. Tell us your figures. Why are you hiding from proper scrutiny? Why are you saying you will not do what Peter Costello said you should do, and that is submit your, your I costings? Actually, I actually You're saw not... Peter Costello at the airport today. <laughs> Uh, and I'm so, going to say so he just, said that what we were doing was just right, thank uh, you. Oh, oh, so you ran into Peter Costello and he said everything's going OK. Wow. <laughs> Actually, that is true. There you that go. OK, true. all right, all right. So we, we've got, we've got, Yasmin, you can have, have a quick, quick the comment, then we've got to move on. I think you're, you're That's conflating... That's a great test. There's two things. The economy is important, but the budget is not the is not the entirety of the economy. And I think that's that's a miscommunication. I think by focusing so much on the budget, you're saying the economy is ruined. But the, but the budget is... The economy is so much more than just the budget. And I think that's an important distinction. Actually, I do, I do agree absolutely with that. But the, the budget is an indispensable element. But the economy is about people and jobs. And what we want to do well, is we want to get people. the economy to a situation where we can create a million jobs and you have to do that by living within your means. You have to oh. reduce Austerity taxes. measures will create jobs, no, will you it? actually have to reduce Austerity taxes rather than will add taxes. Create jobs. OK, I'm gonna, that, that, to I'm, I think we've heard both sides of that jobs. argument. So let's move along. It's election time. You're watching Q&A. Our next question comes from Richard Bray. Yes, uh, thanks, Tony. This question's for Doug Cameron and for Greg Hunt. Housing affordability is the number one issue for voters, according to a recent survey. Yet Labor and Liberal have been silent on this issue. Home buyers are constantly outbid by investors, which has helped create this problem. Um, sorry, outbid by investors, turned away by high prices and remain renting. Combined with population growth, other taxes and policy, this helps keeps rent high and pushes low income earners into housing stress and homelessness. When will both sides of government make the hard yet necessary tax and policy changes to address this issue? I'm, I'm going to go to Yasmin first because I saw you nodding there um, assiduously. Yeah, I, I actually agree with the questioner as a young person. You know, I. I... I'm one of the lucky ones in terms of I've come out of university and, and I have a, a full-time job and that sort of thing. And I look at the, the, the dream of, you know, buying a house and having a white picket fence and all these sort of things. And it's almost, um, it's al it seems impossible to achieve when, when your entry house is almost half a million dollars. I mean, I live in Brisbane, and I and I think my parents ten years ago, you know, they we we came in as as migrants, and and they saved for years and years and years to be able to make a deposit to be able to buy a house that was le less than half the kind of the price that it is at the moment. So I completely agree, and I think we're as a nation, our cities are m some of the most expensive in the world. How on earth are we supposed to be able to, to deal with this? And it's something I'm interested in hearing. Yeah, it's one of the big sleeper issues. Pam Williams, what are your thoughts? I mean, uh, is there a way of tackling it? Look, uh, I think, you know, the Australian housing market is, is, is a beast that it's got its own momentum at all times and it defies really anything that we can, um, you know, uh, do to it to slow it down. We thought it would slow down a few years ago, but how, it, how you change that whole metric to bring it back in, into some sort of, you know, uh, space where, where comparatively what Yasmin is saying is that, you know, you make housing prices, housing achievable for people and for young people in particular. I really, I honestly have no answer to that. Well, the question had raised yes. one issue and that is that investors get financial incentives uh, so wealthy people can yeah. buy houses and get tax deductions through negative yes, gearing. Yes, that um, is indeed. That's something that uh, no government mm. will touch, obviously. No government will touch that, and, and many governments have thought about touching it, of course, and have then stepped away. I mean, Keating, at a certain point, you know, um, notoriously sort of looked into, uh, you know, pulling away from all kinds of things, and, uh, you know, they, they can't do it, because once the half of the country is, is investing in these properties and uh, taking the big tax gains, you know, you, you almost bring on a firestorm 
on by trying to step away from that. And I've not seen, um, and I'm sure that neither Greg nor uh, uh, Doug would be wanting to make any kind of commitment to uh, either of their parties stepping away from those kinds of tax breaks. No one's going to touch it. Let's hear what uh, Doug Cameron says. And by the way, uh, Mark Latham, actually, uh, when he was Labor leader, did uh, make a suggestion that uh, negative gearing should be on the agenda to have a look at. Uh, I think Peter Costello famously said that was a, a commitment that lasted from late line to lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Well, I'm not making any commitment tonight on that. Uh, so surprised that... to hear that. And, um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm, not that, I'm not that crazy brave. Uh, but, but do you agree but, it's, it is a great yeah, look, sleeper issue? Listen to Yasmin, oh, yeah, listen to the yeah. questionnaire, the, uh, you know, the huge but, number of young people out there wondering yeah. if they ever will be able to buy a house in this country. Well, not to mention the yeah, homeless people that yeah. he was talking about. Well, I've been parliamentary secretary for housing and homelessness for four weeks. Uh, I must say, when I started, be an expert by now. When I started looking in <laughs> to, the, to the issues, uh, there are a number of tax issues that are very important, and that's one of them. There are a, a range of other issues, and, and I must say to the questioner that you, you say Labour is not saying anything about it or doing anything. We've invested $30.1 billion in housing and homelessness. We've got, a, we've got a policy on homelessness, how you should reduce it. The coalition don't have any policy on homelessness. We've got a policy on housing that's built around uh, the rental assistance scheme to try and build uh, you know, tens of thousands of houses at 20% under the market rate. We are pouring huge amounts of money in. We're putting money into infrastructure to try and make the plots cheaper around the country. And I can go on and on. We have done so much on housing, and yet the coalition under this... Every time you see Tony Abbott, you know, wandering out with this... Just remember, there is nothing in it on housing and homelessness. There's nothing in it on the big policy issues that are facing this country. And I've got to say that if you're looking at a party that's the, for a party to vote for that cares about housing and homelessness, that's this party. This is, this is uh, you know, National Ho uh, Homeless Persons Week, and I haven't heard a word out of the coalition on that. Haven't heard a word. Let's hear from Graham Morris sitting right beside you. Um, that is actually the umbrella document. There's, oh. an, there's another 20 or 30 documents. <laughs> and, and before the campaign's over, yeah. there'll be a hell of a lot more. When are you costing them? There'll be a hell of a lot more. When, when are you costing them? About the same time as you yeah. lot did last I, election. Ours is done. Ours is done. <laughs> ours is costing. I, yeah. I, look, Graham, I, that is, that, that is uh, yeah. that, you, just a little side comment you made. Um, really does go to the sort of cynicism that people see in politics. Um, why... Do we have to wait till right before the because actual election? Because all the policies have to come out. All the policies have to come out. We've got 11... But you, already, got... but you know what they are now. No, you don't, Tony. There, real there are, solutions. There... You've got real solutions. <laughs> there, are, there are 12 million voters in this country. 11 million already made up their mind. But there are a million people out there who are still to make up their mind, and they make up their minds very, very late. Are you seriously, are you why... seriously saying that at this point, four weeks out from the election, a lot of those policies still don't exist? No, I'm saying they haven't been announced, same as he's That's got. That's my point. So if they exist, then you know how much they cost and the public surely has a right to know. What you'd say, hey... Stop hiding on this. That's, you're that's hiding. The wrong, you haven't released your You're hiding, hiding you're disassembling. Parties. That's no. what you're doing. And, and the public deserve to see your policies. And they will. And, and they, they will. deserve to and know how yeah. much they, they cost. I'll, I'll go can I, can well, I come yes, back to the, housing, briefly, I want to, to, hear from to the housing thing? There are three things that I think are really, really important. One is I'm a great believer in the first home buyer sort of grant, where the, peop, the young people get a bit of a start for about 14 grand or something. The other is, uh, and there's two more, one is I think if there was a change of government, we will have more confidence and I think this confidence thing mm. has been missing in the last really? few years, where people can invest, go out and buy, and, and but you know, have a go at having having home ownership. And the other is, I don't think the bureaucrats are the best people in the world to run housing in this country. I think people like, like you know, the, the 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 kids off the street people, Mission Australia, they are just fantastic at homelessness. But that's okay. what's Not happening. Right. That, that's what's uh, happening. Okay. Uh, just just a brief one because we've got one more question we want to come to. Okay, so look very briefly on um, on housing. There are three practical things that we want to do. 
One is in relation to land costs, and the only way you can do that is to provide more land and work on land release. One thing in particular that we're looking at is whether or not you can take the great dead spaces under the enormous transmission corridors, bury the transmission, re uh, realise the value by releasing the land, half to land, half to public space. The second thing is on construction costs. On construction costs, $5,000 is the average view according to the Housing Industry Association with relation to the impact of the carbon tax. That will go. That's not going to solve everything, but it has a significant element. And then the, uh, the third part is confidence. It's about the ability to have an economy that's mobilised. So there are three practical things okay. that we want to work on. Greg, a question has got his hand up. I'll just go back to you briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to <clears throat> go back to what Graham was saying. The first home buyers grants have actually been derided as home vendor grants because basically the money has been put onto the house anyway by the agents. So it's actually been a lot of wasteful spending. And I mean, the Liberals are always going on about wasteful spending. That is massively wasteful spending and basically has helped out vendors and it really hasn't helped out buyers, yet state governments still keep doing it. At least they're now putting them onto new housing to try and create new housing. Um, another point I'd like to make is that brochure that you have, for me, is just basically a travel brochure for Fantasy Island. I mean, I've looked at it <laughs> and it's got nothing in it for me. OK, we'll take that as a comment. Um, we're nearly out of time. Our last question tonight comes from Maeve McGregor. Thank you. My question is to Mr Cameron. Mr Cameron, you've often reiterated the importance of developing refugee policy in accordance with international law and human rights. After Julia Gillard was deposed, you told Lateline that you were pretty convinced Rudd wouldn't indulge in a race to the bottom on refugees. Given Rudd's radical and entirely unprincipled change in position which you support, are you not participating in rank hypocrisy for short-term political gain? Mm. Well, I must say, I, I don't know whether you've sort of followed what I've said over a long period of time on this. Uh, I go back uh, many years in terms of supporting refugees being treated in a humanitarian uh, way in this country. Uh, actually, I got Malcolm Fraser to come to the AMWU National Council uh, conference when I was the Secretary of the Union uh, to talk about refugees. So I've had a long involvement and long support for refugees. So can but, you guarantee, to pick up the point, you but, haven't got much time, just, no, you well, haven't got much time, so can yeah. you guarantee they will be um, treated in a humanitarian way, yeah. in the same way they'll be treated yeah. in Australia, in Papua New Guinea? Well, that's, that's what the Minister is saying. That's the, what the Minister is uh, attempting to do. Uh, I just don't want our uh, Navy to be picking kids out of the sea. I just don't think that's right. And I think the humanitarian thing is to stop people being killed at sea. Husbands being killed, wives being killed, kids being killed, thousands of people. And the estimates the government's getting is 50,000 people queuing up to come here next year, a 4% uh, death rate, 2,000 people killed. What's humanitarian about that? I say we need to ensure that people are treated fairly, we need to increase the, the refugee intake in this country. We need to play our part. But unless you deal with the issues at the source, the issues of poverty, the issues of, uh, of people being vilified, the people, people being killed, wars, then it's always going to be a problem. So my view is you're better off stopping people being killed in leaky, rotten boats. And that's the position I've come to over a long period of time. OK, we've got very, very uh, close to time. So quick answers from everyone. Yasmin. You know, what frustrates me the most about this is that the PNG solution is purely political and it's touted as something that's done for the safety of the people that are coming. I think, I think that, that frustrates me. If it was really about the safety of the refugees and asylum seekers that are coming, the money would be put into helping the UNHCR process better. It would be put into helping prosecute people smugglers themselves and not punishing those that are coming in and seeking asylum. You've got to find them first. Th that's beside the point. That's the not beside the point. You've My got to find them, you've got to have the intelligence, you've got to have the police working And does the in Australian Indonesia. Federal Police not have that capacity? I have... I, I believe that they do, and I think that if it was really about the safety of the people, there would be a proper process rather than this policy that's just come out purely to, to go to, and race to the bottom and, and, and get those elections. Yeah, I, I agree there should be a proper process, but it's got to be a regional framework and it's got to try and deal with the issues at the source okay. and it's got right. to make sure... We, we really, we really are nearly well. out of time. Greg Hunt. Last week we learnt that uh, people smugglers who were coming on boats were being sent back to Indonesia, not prosecuted in Australia. Secondly, 
This, in my view, when you look at the 1,100 lives which had been the official position until today, if it's 2,000, that's even more tragic, that have been lost only since the laws were changed oh, by the current on. Prime that's Minister. That is when it began. We warned that's about it, nonsense. we worried about it, we said that this would be a human tragedy, and it has been a human tragedy. Nobody what? wanted it, but it was foreseen and forewarned. It was ignored by Mr Rudd, and since that time we've had, in my view, the greatest peacetime policy failure in Australian history. The human catastrophe is enormous okay. and it has to stop. OK, I'm just going to go back. You, you do get a chance to respond to that. Yeah, look, I think the, the government has... Uh, and, and Prime Minister Howard... Uh, Prime Minister uh, Rudd has indicated... Well, I'll go back to Howard because... Gillard? But, no, because, you know, John Howard was operating in a completely different... Uh, atmosphere, a completely different situation. He created Things that changed. situation. He didn't create that situation. He created and defined the, 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 the si circumstances. The situation, Hold on a sec. Got to let him answer. The, the situation at the time was conducive to making sure boats stop. That's the international situation. Yep. It's changed. You've got international people smugglers. They're all over the world now putting people through into Australia, and that's the big problem, and we've got to try and deal with it. All right, Grant, briefly. I used to think that Doug was roughly where the heart and soul of the Labor Party was. But what he just said is essentially what John Howard would say. And you wonder, where is the heart and the soul of the Labor Party now? Well, I'm going to have to leave it there. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Graham Morris, Doug Cameron, Pamela Williams, Yasmin Abdel-Majid and Greg Hunt. <laughs> thank you very much. Next Monday... We'll be joined by the Minister for Finance, Penny Wong, the Manager of Opposition Business, Christopher Pine, the Deputy Leader of the Greens, Adam Bant, actor, commentator and Kevin Rudd confidant, Rhys Muldoon, and the Australian's columnist, Janet Albrechtson. Until then, good night. <laughs>